NAD levels decline during aging, and one strategy for reversing that is supplementation with niacinamide, NAM. NAM is converted into NMN, which is then converted into NAD. But potentially we fix one problem, but make another worse. And that's because uh, homocysteine increases in response to niacinamide supplementation. And we can see that here. So plasma levels of homocysteine on the y-axis are plotted against time after supplementation with uh, nicotinic acid, NA, or niacinamide. In this case, it was 300 milligrams of niacinamide. So when compared to controls, uh, that so people who consumed water, people that uh, were supplemented with 300 milligrams of niacinamide, one and a half hours after supplementation, we can see plasma homocysteine increase from 11 micromolar to 16, and then three hours after supplementation, uh, homocysteine went up from 11 to 18 micromolar. So why is homocysteine important? So first, homocysteine increases during aging, and that's what we can see here. So starting with the data on the left, in the study of about 16,000 subjects, uh, when looking at the data for the men with the white bars and the women for the dark gray or, or black bars, uh, we can see that homocysteine increases for both men and women. Now, in a relatively small study, but that included uh, ages that went beyond the study on the left up to 67 years, we can see that over the age of 67, starting with the group that was 65 to 69 years old, we can see that homocysteine continues to increase from the 65 to 69 year old age range all the way up past 80. So from this, we can conclude that homocysteine increases during aging, at least from the 40 to uh, 80 year uh, age group. So what's the systemic impact for higher levels of homocysteine? Well, homocysteine is associated with or directly impacts the health of many organ systems, and that's what we can see here. So for the cardiovascular system, it's been linked with atherosclerosis, so uh, fatty streaks in the arteries. Uh, it's been linked with cardiovascular diseases, heart attack, and stroke. Uh, for the kidney, it's been associated with uh, kidney dysfunction, reduced kidney function, uh, with bone fractures in osteoporotic uh, patients, with diabetes, with uh, reproductive issues, including uh, menopause, sexual dysfunction, and pregnancy, uh, deficits in sight and hearing. And then in the nervous system, it's been linked with epilepsy, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and dementia. So let's take a look at some of the Alzheimer's uh, uh, and dementia-related uh, data. So that's what we can see here. Uh, relative risk for Alzheimer's-related dementia on the y-axis plotted against the blood level of homocysteine on the x-axis. And when looking at the, uh, the uh, trend line for uh, relative risk being one or higher, that's where the uh, levels of homocysteine would be significantly associated with the incidence of Alzheimer's-related dementia, we can see that blood homocysteine levels in the 14 to 35 micromolar range are associated with an increased risk for the presence of Alzheimer's disease-related dementia. Now, also notice that lowest risk for Alzheimer's disease-related dementia is uh, present for uh, values, homocysteine values that are around five micromolar. So it would appear that uh, lower is better, at least for uh, Alzheimer's disease-related dementia risk. So what about all-cause mortality risk? So risk of death for all causes. And this is a meta-analysis of six studies that included uh, uh, more than 18,000 subjects. And once again, we can see that uh, lower may be better and that as the uh, uh, blood levels of homocysteine increase, there's a significantly increased risk for all-cause mortality. So again, as low as possible may be optimal for homocysteine in terms of all-cause mortality risk. So what's my data? I've been tracking homocysteine since uh, 2005, so how am I doing in resisting the age-related increase at the very least? So that's what we, we're starting to look at here. So this is my homocysteine data from 2005 to 2021, and I've measured it 18 times over that time period. Now I started di dietary tracking, so weighing all my food and then logging all of that data for macro and micronutrients uh, in 2015. But before then, I, I measured more sporadically from 2005 to 2009, and we can see six data points during that uh, time period for homocysteine levels. And uh, my average homocysteine during that time was 7.1 micromolar, which isn't too bad. Uh, it's pretty close to the five, that you know, lowest risk uh, for Alzheimer's disease-related dementia uh, of five micromolar. Now, I mentioned I started dietary tracking in uh, 2015, so since then I've measured 12 times, and we can see a much wider range, including uh, a, a data point as high as 15, which is definitely going in the wrong direction. So my average over the last uh, six years is 10.3 micromolar, which is definitely going in the wrong direction. So uh, in, when looking at these two groups of data, the before dietary tracking, 2005 to 2009, and since I've been dietary tracking 2015 to the present, these two groups of data are significantly different. So one can conclude that I've definitely succumbed to the age-related increase for homocysteine. 
Now there is a, a silver lining to this uh, uh, data. As we can see, my last five measurements, my homocysteine has been less than 9.1 in five consecutive measurements. And my average homocysteine over that period is 8.2 which when compared with the before dietary tracking data is not significantly different. So the big question then is how have I recently kept homocysteine relatively low? So to uh, assess that, we need to take a look at homocysteine metabolism, uh, and that's what's shown here. So starting with homocysteine right in the center, uh, if there's a B6, vitamin B6 deficiency, homocysteine will accumulate because homocysteine requires uh, B6 as a cofactor to be converted into cystathionine, and then uh, it's B6 is also required to convert cystathionine into cysteine. And if you take it further, you can see that cysteine can then be incorporated into GSH, glutathione. Uh, so if you have a B6 deficiency, not only will homocysteine potentially accumulate, but you will also have potential decreases in uh, glutathione uh, synthesis. So uh, also B12 can contribute to a homocysteine accumulation. So uh, uh, B12 is required as a required cofactor for homocysteine to be converted back into methionine. But it's not just B12 that's involved in that conversion. Uh, uh, dietary folic acid, which is uh, converted into uh, blood levels of folate, is also required for the reaction that converts homocysteine into uh, methionine. And last but not least, uh, a betaine deficiency. So betaine is also known as trimethylglycine. So uh, betaine plus homocysteine is converted into methionine and dimethylglycine. So if you're betaine deficient, you can also have a potential accumulation for homocysteine. Now, interestingly, uh, for uh, seven weeks in 2020, I tried high-dose betaine, trimethylglycine, uh, so four grams uh, of betaine per day, and uh, the resulting homocysteine uh, in my data was 11.8 micromolar, which, although it's not my highest level around 15, it's certainly not in that nine range over my last five measurements. So I ditched it because it didn't seem to have a major impact on my data. However, I've been supplementing uh, for the past three years with a, a daily stack of 400 micrograms per day of methylfolate, uh, 1,000 micrograms per day of methyl uh, B12, and up to 50 uh, milligrams per day of vitamin B6. So uh, when considering I've been tracking my diet for the past uh, six years uh, and logging all that data into an Excel file, we can see if uh, which, which or all of these uh, vitamins may be uh, most important for keeping homocysteine low. So uh, is, homocysteine, is homocysteine correlated with my dietary intake of folate B6 and or B12? So first looking at the data for plasma levels of homocysteine on the y-axis against my average daily folate intake, uh, and that's also including from supplements, uh, we can see that although that there's a uh, negative correlation, meaning higher levels of, uh, of folate are correlated with lower levels of homocysteine, that correlation is not statistically significant as indicated by the p-value of 0 0.13. Uh, also not significant is the correlation for my average daily B6 intake with plasma levels of homocysteine. You can see the trend line for that data is approximately flat. Uh, and, this, and the correlation is not, uh, it's not a significant correlation as indicated by the p-value of 0 0.87. So from this, we can conclude that homocysteine may not be significantly correlated with my dietary intake of folate or B6. What about B12? And actually, we do see a significant correlation here. So first, starting with uh, the data where I wasn't supplementing with vitamin B12, and I have four data points for that on the left, my average homocysteine was 12.7 micromolar. And then with uh, vitamin B12 supplementation, I have eight uh, plasma homocysteine measurements, and we can see that my average uh, homocysteine level there is 9.1, so about a 30% reduction uh, with vitamin B12. Now, uh, when comparing without B12 supplementation, the four data points with the eight data points for with vi uh, vitamin B supplementation, these two groups of data are significantly different, which suggests that uh, vitamin B12 is contributing to the lower levels of homocysteine. But B12 may not be the only factor contributing to this reduction. And inter interestingly, an even stronger correlation for lower hip homocysteine is uh, with my average daily protein intake. That's what we can see here. So the correlation coefficient is negative 0.86. And uh, a correlation, uh, when it's a negative correlation, the closer you get to negative 1, that's as strong as it gets. It's perfectly linear. So uh, that's a better correlation with protein versus homocysteine versus my B12. Uh, correlation with homocysteine. So this suggests higher protein intake, lower homocysteine. So uh, I actually have, we can take a deeper look at that data to investigate how much B12 is contributing and how much my protein intake uh, may be contributing to the lower homocysteine. So let's have a look at that. So here I've got listed 
each date that I measured uh, homocysteine and the corresponding average protein intake that corresponded to that homocysteine uh, 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 measurement, and then my average B12 intake uh, that corresponds to each homocysteine measurement. So first, when I wasn't supplementing with B12, my average protein intake based on those four measurements was about uh, 99 grams per day, and my average homocysteine level was 12.7. Now, Note that I'm not deficient for B12 here. The RDA for uh, vitamin B12 is 2.4 micrograms per day. So even just for these four data points, I'm at least you know, around five-fold higher than the RDA, but still my homocysteine is going in the wrong direction. Now for the next three data points, I was supplementing now with uh, 1,000 micrograms per day of vitamin B12. And if you notice the March 19th, 2018 data, it's 936 micrograms per day on average that corresponds to that 10.8 homocysteine measurement. So I, I wasn't obviously um, um, taking my B12, you know, the, the stack of the three vitamins every day. That's why it's a little bit less than 1,000 micrograms on average for that, for that uh, measurement. But nonetheless, I have three data points where I've supplemented with uh, vitamin B12. My protein intake, although it's uh, five grams higher with an average of 104 grams per day in those three measurements, it's not significantly different from the 99 grams per day in the previous four measurements. And my average homocysteine over those three measurements is 10.5 micromolar. So this is about a 20% reduction that one can infer may be related completely to vitamin B12. Now in the last group of data, my B12 intake is the same. It's a, it's a, a, a little bit more than 1,000 micrograms per day, but my protein intake is higher. It's on average 24 grams per day higher uh, than the previous uh, uh, periods with an average protein uh, intake, average dietary protein intake of 128 grams per day. And based on that, my homocysteine levels are 8.2, so a further 20% reduction. So it looks like B12 on its own, uh, without changing protein, 20% reduction in homocysteine, but then B12 with the combination of higher protein, a further additional 20% reduction in homocysteine. So the big question is high, how is higher uh, protein contributing to lower homocysteine? And superficially, one could say, well, you've got 24 more grams per day of protein. You may be getting more B12. That may be contributing. But I'd argue that may not be the case because at best, maybe I'll get one to two micrograms of extra B12, assuming that's from animal, an increase in animal protein for those extra 24 grams. Is 1,009 micrograms of B12 really different from 1,011? I'm not so sure about that. So if anyone's got any ideas how higher protein could be contributing to lower homocysteine, please leave a comment up below. And that's all I've got for now. Uh, thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, thanks a lot. And I hope you uh, enjoyed the video. Have a great day.